Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, although it's almost noon now with our little delay, uh, but I hope you can hold your hunger for lunch a little bit longer um, because I'd like to welcome you to our second panel for the day. And um, maybe one can say when, when discussing Syria um, and the conflict uh, and the tragedy that has unfolded in the last four years there, there is a tendency both in the region uh, and abroad, also especially here in Germany, to view that conflict purely as a theater for regional and international powers fighting through proxies for dominance in the region. Um, and while this view is clearly problematic in a sense that it takes the agenda away from the Syrians and rather degrades them to just being pawns of outside powers. Um, one cannot deny that the way the war has continued in the last years would not have been possible without outside interference. Um, and to just discuss these regional powers and their influence on the conflict in Syria um, and possible solution or at least possible changes to be made towards the solution. Um, I'm very honored to have with me here my four guests. Um, this is Miss Hanin uh, Redder uh, from Lebanon. Uh, she's a graduate from the American University in Beirut. Um, and is currently the editor of Now Media, um, and you write on Lebanese politics, uh, mostly on the Shiite community, but also on the role of um, Shiites of Iran and Hezbollah in, in Syria. Um, she's also a fellow of the Atlantic Council, has worked for the Woodrow Wilson Center, and is a regular contributor to outlets such as the New York Times and Foreign Policy. Welcome. Then, on the very, my very right, I have Professor Jubin Godarsi. Uh, he's currently the deputy head of the Department for International uh, Relations at the Webster University in Geneva. He received his doctorate from the London School of Economics in London and has since worked for uh, quite a number of renowned think tanks uh, and for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, he writes regularly on Syria and the Middle East in general. Welcome, Professor. And to my very left, to turn back again, uh, is Oytun Orhan. He comes from, uh, to us from Ankara uh, today, where he is a fellow at the Center for Middle Eastern Strategic Studies, ORSAM. Um, he received his PhD from the University in Bolu with a thesis on Syria's regional policy. So he has been quite in the game for, for quite a long time. He concentrates on Syria and Lebanon currently, but he has previously worked on other countries in the region as um, a UN election observer, for example, in Iraq. And he writes regularly on the Middle East. Welcome. And last but not least, Sebastian Zons. Uh, Sebastian Zons uh, probably had the shortest way today to come to us because he currently works with the German Council on Foreign Relations, the DGRP. Um, he is a specialist on Saudi Arabia. He's currently pursuing his PhD on, I have to recap that, migrant workers and their perception in the media in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And he's currently engaged with the uh, DGRP in a project on the Gulf countries' regional policy towards Egypt and Tunisia post-Arab Spring. Welcome, Sebastian. Maybe to, to start with, Professor Godarsi, maybe we, we start with you. All eyes are currently on Iran when it comes to the nuclear negotiations or for deal for that hopefully... Uh, Come, I mean, the deal has already been struck, but the details are still a bit fishy. Um, there is the fear among many analysts that uh, with the nuclear deal with Tehran, um, a sanctions relief from the Americans would free a lot of frozen assets, 
that might then make it easier for the Iranian government to continue propping up the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad. Um, I mean, how long can Iran really uh, go on with supporting Syria? This has probably quite been costly to the regime. Um, and how long are they willing to continue with that? Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure and privilege to be here. I want to thank the Heinrich Boll Stiftung for the kind invitation. I'm glad to be here today. Um, before delving into the details in terms of your question, um, just one or two quick points I'd like to make um, with regard to Iran and Syria. As an author of, of a book on the alliance between Iran and Syria, um, these two countries, that, more specifically these two regimes, have had a long-standing alliance since 1979 for 36 years, and Iran has been the key regional backer of the Assad regime since 2011. Um, that said, um, uh, I think one should also mention that I think the Iranian attitude, especially over time in view of how events have unfolded in Syria over the past four years, has, can be characterized as very ambivalent in the sense that Iran, just as many other countries, Turkey, the US and all that, never foresaw that events would would you know, unfold the way they did over the past four years. Iran initially started assisting the regime during the protests and all that, hoping the protests would be quelled, uh, the situation would, would um, uh, calm, would be restored. Very much similar to what happened in Iran in the summer of 2009 after the disputed elections um, in Iran. Of course, that did not happen, and then the unrest and protests morphed into an armed uh, conflict. And Iran, ever since, has been providing critical support for Syria. I can go into more details, maybe, during the question and answer. Um, but Iran is firmly, I would say, behind the Assad regime, but at the same time, in view of the, the way the Assad regime initially dealt with the protests and in terms of the tactics it's used in the war, there's a great deal of unease in Iran and official circles in the sense that if they can find a substitute, a solution, some sort of way out, they want to do that. And I think they've been doing that on and off since the summer of 2011. Um, with, regard to, with regard to the, the question, I think, well, um, as, as you mentioned, you've had the interim agreement in April between the P5 plus one with Iran, and the, the negotiators are trying to flesh out the details. As they always say, the devil is in the details for a final agreement on the nuclear issue by the end of June. It, it's very hard to tell how things will unfold if there, there is an agreement. Um, I think they could unfold in two ways. And uh, one also must mention that if there is an agreement, um, I think there are people, parties on both camps who interpret, would interpret the agreement in very different ways. I think as far as President Rouhani in Iran and his people um, and President Obama are concerned, this agreement could be a stepping stone uh, in, in the road towards normalization, rapprochement between the two sides. Um, Rouhani is not a moderate, he's not a reformist. He's a conservative, but he's a pragmatic conservative. So in, in other words, what I'm trying to say is he's not trapped in an ideological cage. So I think if that happens, um, and if he and his people prevail, this could lead to, could spill over in terms of cooperation in other arenas between Iran and the US, Iran and the US, perhaps in terms of trying to come up with a political solution to the Syria crisis. At the same time, there are parties on both sides in Tehran, also in Washington and also in the Gulf Arab states and Israel who do not want an agreement, who are very much satisfied with the status quo in terms of the 36-year-long hostility between Iran and the US, which is of course started by Iran in 79, starting with the embassy hostage crisis, um, in terms of because you have this tendency in Middle East politics to see everything as a zero-sum game in the sense that the, the, um, the concern that any type of reconciliation between Washington and Tehran might be at the expense of the Gulf Arabs or Israel, but this, of course, is not necessarily the, the, the case. Um, 
If there is a deal, of course, Iran has been suffering under the sanctions, especially since the sanctions in 2010 and 11, which were piled on by the US and the European Union. So the situation in Iran has deteriorated. I go to Iran frequently about half a dozen times a year. A year. Um, so the people have suffered, the regime has suffered, the people have suffered more. So I think the regime, irrespective of which, where you stand politically in the Iranian political elite, they want this matter to be resolved because if things persist down the road, this may cause problems and they may have a political crisis or an insurrection on their hand. And as we all know, authoritarian regimes want to survive. Um, I don't think if, this, if there is an agreement and the sanctions are lifted, this will automatically mean that Iran will up the ante in terms of increasing aid to Syria. It depends on how things unfold. Things are moving very fast especially over the past few weeks and the past few months. Uh, as I said, there's a great deal of ambivalence um, because, um, in, in, in essence, Tehran knows that the pre-March 2011 political status quo anti in Syria cannot be restored. That's clear. And this crisis has cost them dearly in terms of their standing and reputation in the Middle East and the Muslim world. Um, it's laid, led to the destabilization of Syria, Iraq, and possibly it could Lebanon. Um, you know, basically, it's led to Shia Sunni tensions, and uh, Iran cannot con continue to pour billions of dollars into the coffers of Assad to finance uh, his, his survival. Um, so I, I think they're 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 looking for a way out, um, but they want a, a substitute a solution. They're not going to basically push, um, I think Iran and Russia have the ability, if they want, to try to persuade Assad to step down or take up um, an exile, uh, you know, in maybe Sochi on the Black Sea or Ramsar on the Caspian coast in Iran. But um, I think as far as Iran is concerned, there needs to be some sort of substitute. Is that something to fill in the hole? Because they do not want Syria to disintegrate and, 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 and fall apart. Um, uh, so um, I, I think they're very much interested in being part of the negotiations. Unfortunately, they were excluded from Geneva I and Geneva II, um, which I think was a mistake. Um, if you want to solve the Syrian problem, the Syrian problem has become such a thorny, complex issue that you know it's not just the domestic actors. You need to include all the major regional actors, stakeholders, and the major powers, the US, the EU, um, and, and, and Russia, so you know, whether you like them or, or not. So they have to be uh, included. Um, and of course, this will, will you know, um, I, I don't see any, any other way to, uh, to, around that. Um, I, I would just like to add in terms of you need a political track, but following up on what Ambassador Hoff said earlier today, I don't think a political track and a military track are necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, you could use the threat of military force or limited military strikes to push the Assad regime to the negotiating table. Um, so I, th I don't think it's either or. Um, kind of like, if you want a historical example, like what happened during the Vietnam peace negotiations during the Christmas bombing in 72, 73, in terms of what Nixon did with the bombing of North Vietnam and bringing the North Vietnamese back to the negotiating table. So uh, with regard to Iran, if there is a rapprochement, if there is, I think they would, they would try to, um, uh, I think they, they're, they're looking for a political solution. And just the final word, I think the, the events over the past few months, weeks have been very disconcerting to, for, for, um, for Iran in the sense that it, it seems the Gulf Arabs and Turkey seems, seem to have upped the ante in terms of providing more support for the Syrian opposition. You've had the fall of Busra, Jishr al um of Idlib, and, and now Palmyra, and also growing the growing power of ISIS. So um, although I don't think either side in the Syrian conflict has the, the ability to deal the decisive blow to the other side, um, what might happen is with time right now, because of Assad's dwindling support and greater support for opposition, the regime may collapse, but that may create a very dangerous vacuum and the situation may go from bad, um, bad to... Uh, to, to worse in Syria. In, in terms of the economic price that Iran is currently paying, I mean, do you see a change if these assets would be unfrozen? 
Um, uh, I, yeah, in, in terms of the economic assistance, the military and economic assistance that Iran has provided, uh, Syria, I don't know, maybe um, one of our previous panelists, um, Mr. Yazigi, might, might also be able to shed light on that. Um, you, you have very conflicting figures in the press that since the... Since 2011, Iran has been pumping one to two billion dollars a month, supporting the Assad regime, or something, you know, 35 billion dollars uh, a year. Um, so I, I don't think I think those figures are exaggerated. And a lot of the reports coming from the Syrian opposition about Iranian financial, military, material support are exaggerated. Although Iranian support is critical, um, so you've had billions of dollars. Uh, allocated, spent in Syria, and also material support. Um, but I, I, um, I, I don't think, as I said, I, I don't think even if the sanctions are lifted, they're going to continue. Uh, I think they're definitely looking for a political, uh, political solution, um, as I said, because Assad in the long run, they, they don't think, I think, Assad generally has a future, but they're not going to pull the rug under his, from under his feet without a substitute or something being lined up. Thank you. When, when talking about regional actors who are paying quite a high price, uh, I think one that comes to mind uh, in Lebanon is Hezbollah. Um, I mean, how do you evaluate that? What does the, the involvement of Hezbollah in the Syrian war cost them at home? I mean, how has their standing in the Lebanese society changed? Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you to be. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm here definitely to talk about Hezbollah's involvement in Syria, but looking at the context of Hezbollah's in Syria, I have to start with the basics, which is um, the world has abandoned Syria. We all know that now. No, the Syrian people are on their own, as uh, uh, Ambassador Fred Hoff said before. Uh, but Assad's friends did not abandon him. And that's the problem that we are facing today. And I say friends between parentheses because uh, I don't think Iran or Hezbollah or Iran's factions in Syria are there to protect Assad as a person or the regime because they love the regime. They are there to protect their interests. And that's exactly what Hezbollah is doing there, protecting Iran's interests in Syria. These interests are basically twofold. One is very political and practical, which basically securing the corridor, the logistic link between uh, the uh, Alawite coast in the north up to Damascus and Qalamun to the Bekaa borders uh, of Lebanon. This corridor is very essential, but it also is uh, uh, ideological because Iran's expansion, the Shia uh, revolution, the Islamic revolution expansion is very important for uh, uh, the Iranians. Without this expansion, Iran will only become a nation, and that's not good for the revolution. The part, very major part of the Islamic revolution is the expansion of the revolution, and this is definitely part of it. And this is what Hezbollah is doing in Syria. I really believe that the nuclear program is not as important for Iran as this expansion in the region. This is the main concern for Iran. And any political solution that would guarantee this, they will accept it. Any political solution that will not allow this expansion and the control of some part of Syria which stretches from the coast up to the Lebanese border, they will accept that. Anything else besides that, is at, it's, it's not going to be on the table. They will never accept any polit political solution that does not uh, guarantee that. Hezbollah's involvement in Syria started from the very, very beginning. And the excuses were so many. First, protecting the Shiites on the border, then the shrine of Sayyidah Zainab. Eventually, until like very recently, this weekend, Nasrallah made a speech and uh, it was extremely clear. For the first time, he said things as they are. And he said two things I think that are very important. He said for the first time that we are everywhere in Syria. And it's not about protecting the regime or protecting the Shia or protecting any shrines, he said it as it is. We are there because this is an existential battle, hinting at a very Shia versus Sunni battle, referring to their battle in Syria as Ma'arakat Sufin. Ma'arakat Sufin is when Imam Ali and Muawiyah fought for the Khilafah, when Muawiyah took the uh, Khilafah afterwards. This is a very, like the way people took it, it was a very sectarian rhetoric. 
referring maybe, it maybe to. Maybe just Sufi. for for the non-Arab speakers, Arabic mm. speakers, the caliphate. It's that you're talking about the caliphate, yeah. Khilafa, Sorry, yes, <laughs> the caliphate, definitely not the caliphate of Baghdadi and uh, the Islamic State. Another kind of uh, the, the older one, 14th, 14th, uh, 14 centuries ago, basically. So, uh, but yeah, what's the difference, really? <laughs> um, so this uh, sectarian rhetoric was more is becoming more and more apparent in Lebanon driving the community in Lebanon also to more sectarian rhetoric from both sides. So the Shia are more now speaking with the Shia rhetoric, the sectarian rhetoric, and Hezbollah also in there, their officials, even Nasrallah himself, the leader, is speaking now as a Shia leader, not as a Lebanese leader. And this made a whole difference. The Sunnis in Lebanon so far has been very, very resilient. Um, you'll be surprised how much, you know, like... Uh, oppression has been going on in the Sunni community. It's not just the refugees, the Syrian refugees. It's also the Sunni community. Every, to every time there's a clash in Tripoli or other areas between Sunni factions and Shiite factions, the Sunnis are being ar arrested, the Sunnis are being interrogated, uh, but the Shiites are left alone. This is a policy in Lebanon that uh, is very clear now that there is a, 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 someone is, is taking sides. The Lebanese authorities are definitely taking sides because simply Hezbollah controls the Lebanese institutions. So this is uh, uh, obvious. But the most interesting part really is within the Shia community itself. For 30 years or more, Hezbollah has been brainwashing the Shia community about Israel and the resistance and how they are the resistance. Of course, there was resistance before Hezbollah, but this, was now, this is now out of the question. It's like they do not refer to that resistance anymore. Hezbollah came as a resistance, provided services for the people. For 30 years, they are the resistance. Their job is to protect Lebanon, defend Lebanon against Israeli occupation, etc., etc., etc. Suddenly, the enemy is someone else. Suddenly, the enemy is the Sunni extremist takfiris, as they refer to them. And everyone who is against Hezbollah is a takfiri, including the Lebanese Shia who are against Hezbollah. They are also not, they don't refer to them as a takfiri because according to the rhetoric... Heretics, again, yeah. hmm? heretics. Worse, no. we, are, we are referred to as agents, uh, uh, traitors, uh, Zionists sometimes, you know, like they, we're used to that now. We were okay with that now. We are agents, traitors, it's fine. We are like, everyone in Lebanon is a traitor to a certain cause if you believe in something else, so it's fine. But recently it's becoming, the, this, this threatening language is becoming even like worse because it's, it's very public and when Nasrallah threatens people against him, you're either a takfiri or a Zionist or a traitor or uh, even being neutral. He said even being neutral or silent is also uh, not accepted anymore. And he said, we will not be silent anymore, and we will consider everyone who is not joining our battle as such, and we will treat them as such, we'll deal with them as such. So this is creating a lot of tension, a lot of, like this is, this is like people are feeling terrorized. But what, I think what hap what's happening is this reaction of Nasrallah, not because you know, like he uh, really is afraid of people like us or people who are against him. Within the Shia community, which is the backbone of Hezbollah, the support base of Hezbollah that he strives on, is a lot of question marks, a lot of doubts. Suddenly, after 30 years of uh, resistance and Israel is the enemy, suddenly more people are, more Shia, like Hezbollah soldiers and recruits are dying in Syria than all these 30 years combined against Israel. With no victory in sight. Usually Hezbollah goes for a war, uh, a month or so, they come back with a divine victory. Every time this happens, divine victory settles everything, despite all the losses, okay? Every time there's a divine victory. Now for four years in Syria, Hezbollah is fighting and losing and fighting and losing with not a single victory. We can talk about small victories like in Qusir, like a little bit in Qalamun, in, in, uh, in, in some areas. But this is not enough. Too many people are dying. At the same time, money is not the same. Iran's more, most of the uh, uh, spending of Iran now is in military operations in Syria, Iraq, etc. So the social services, the medical services in Lebanon is really becoming scarce. We have cards, for example, Hezbollah members have cards, like health insurance cards. You present it anywhere, even at shops in Dahi and in South Lebanon, and you get a discount, 50% discount, or free medical care. They've pulled out these cards now. And people are now like lacking services, disappointed with the resistance, 
more losses in terms of, of they're, they're recruiting they're recruiting 16 year old and uh, 16 year old kids to to without proper training sending them to Syria to die and yes people are asking questions so what Nasrallah is saying basically is that if you're thinking to his own supporters, if you're thinking about questioning us or questioning the sacred mission, the existential battle we are fighting in Syria, you will consider a traitor. So no one is supposed to say anything. Even if you're a Shia who is who support Hezbollah as a resistance but have questions about their battle in Syria, you have to be silent or you will be treated as a traitor. So these, this will result in two things. More sectarian tension in Lebanon, and it will not end well. It's been like on hold for a while, but it, I'm, 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 I have, I know that there are like pockets of like severe tension that will explode any time. And also any opportunity for uh, uh, cre creating an alternative for Hezbollah in, in Lebanon is, uh, is, is not, uh, not going to work anymore. And as for the West, uh, everyone, I think not only in Lebanon and Syria and the region, they're looking at the West uh, in this sectarian battle as if the West is taking sides in a sectarian conflict, siding with the Shiites against the Sunnis. And, and this is very, very dangerous on the long run. I will talk about different things later, so I'll stop now. Thank you. Um, we have a, I mean, we already talked about um, shared community in, in, in Lebanon. I mean, we also know that there is a small uh, shared community in, in eastern Saudi Arabia. And I think they were just hit last week by a terror attack on a mosque in, I forgot the name of the place. Um, and is that already a sign that things, that the whole Syria-Iraq conflict is, is starting to show on the domestic level in Saudi Arabia. Is there a domestic price that Saudi will have to pay as well? Yeah, thank you very much, much Christian, for the question, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, of course, the terror attack in Qatif um, has shown that the situation, the domestic security situation in, in Saudi Arabia can deteriorate um, in the foreseeable future, um, and... Uh, for two reasons. The first of all is that uh, the Saudi leadership, the new Saudi leadership, is um, focusing tremendously on, on the Yemen issue and uh, is fighting the Houthis there. And um, I've talked to a Saudi researcher and with different under, other interlocutors during my last day in, in Saudi Arabia, and all of them um, stated that it might be of utmost importance to first uh, defeat the Houthis or to replace Bashar al-Assad in Syria, um, and secondly, they have to fight Daesh. Uh, I think this is a very big miscalculation from the Saudi perspective, uh, because they feel encircled um, and endangered by, um, um, by Iranian agents, by fifth columns of Iran uh, within the region, in Bahrain, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, and they exaggerate uh, um, for, for ideological and uh, psychological and traditional reasons, uh, the Iranian influence within the region, um, from my point of view. So this, this Iranoia makes them blind on one eye regarding uh, the more um, real threat that is, uh, that is coming from, from Daesh. And um, what we have seen in, in Khatif, in the eastern province, um, and it might be, uh, it, it might have been an I, uh, a Daesh attack. It, it, it's quite o quite obvi obvious. Um, but although we have this conspiracy theory uh, theorists in, in in Saudi Arabia that said, okay, it has been it has been um, influenced or it has been. Um, uh, or, or the attack has been done by uh, by Iranian agents, whatever. Uh, this is uh, this is the fault, or this is a general mistake. Uh, the, uh, the Saudi leadership is is doing that they are fighting the wrong enemies when it comes to domestic stability. So they have to they have to deal with uh, with the uh, with Daesh as a as a threat as a as an enemy regarding um, their legitimacy uh, regarding uh, their conservative um, a way of life uh, regarding uh, the their Wahhabi ideology. Uh, and they they neglect this issue so far. 
Um, so what we have seen in Syria, for example, when it comes to the fight against Daesh is, uh, of course, a uh, turnaround in, in politics. Uh, so uh, the Saudi leadership, the old Saudi, Saudi leadership under, under Abdullah has recognized um, in 2013, as far as I remember, um, that the support for Jabhat al-Nusra um, will backfire uh, in, the, in the midterm or in the short term. And they have replaced uh, the, uh, the, the former uh, chief of, of the Saudi intelligence service, Banda, Prince Bandar Sultan, with the uh, with the um, uh, with uh, Mohammed bin Naif, uh, which is now the the crown prince of the new king uh, Salman, and uh, stopped, as far as I know, the support uh, for for Jabhat al Nusra um, from on on an on an official level. Um, when we are talking about Saudi Arabia, it's very it's it's very intransparent intransparent uh, system, and uh, I, I I think you all know that. So when we talk about support for for jihadis, for jihadists or Salafis in Syria or elsewhere in the world, uh, then we are uh, we we are not exactly sure from which uh, from which this assistance is coming. Assistance is coming. Um, uh, I think that the new government under Salman is is, is very aware of 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 um, of the the. Th Threat of uh, jihadism onto the uh, the security domestic uh, situation, but they cannot, they are not able, or they are maybe they are not willing to control every other players that are uh, that are involved in this issue, coming from the from the Saudi business community, some, coming from uh, Saudi charities, coming from from private from, from private people that are maybe members of the of the Saud, but not in an official uh, position. Uh, so this makes them very difficult to control uh, what support is going to, uh, to to jihadi groups, either in Syria or in Iraq or elsewhere elsewhere on the world. Um, so, uh, from my point of view, Saudi Arabia has to focus more on um, uh, on the fight against Daesh, and not in the mil not only in the military sense, but they have to overthink what what the roots of, of jihadism are, or where are the roots of jihadism. Of course, they are lying in the Wahhabi ideology. And, I mean, you now spoke about security concerns, political concerns, but uh, also purely in economic terms. Um, I mean, the oil price has degraded quite a lot in, in the last years. Is that influencing Saudi decisions how to support militant groups in Syria? It's not only about the support of military military groups. It's also about the support of of allied governments. So um, it's not it's not only about the decreasing oil price. Um, of course, the 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 budget of Saudi Arabia will decrease. Um, for about, I think, 160 billion US dollars uh, during this year. Um, this is a tremendous sum, of course. Um, but uh, the, the Saudi socio-economic situation is, is suffering uh, from, from other obstacles, which are quite similar to that in, in, other, in other countries of the region. High youth unemployment, uh, gender segregation, um, the, uh, the, the, the lack of job opportunities for, uh, for, for, gra for university graduates, and so on and so forth. So the frustration Frustration is rising in Saudi Arabia, and and the the channels to express this discontent have risen uh, has ri has risen as well in the in the in the last four years after the starting of the Arab uprisings. Uh, when it comes to to express uh, discontent via social media, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, etc., and um, this is a this is a situation uh, the Saudi um, the Saudi leadership has to deal with, and uh, they are not. Uh, they are not prepared for that. So the traditional way of of providing welfare to uh, to their citizens um, cannot be is not sustainable in the future because they don't have the money uh, for all the for all the young people that are that are um, th that want to get a job uh, that want to that want to have future opportunities. This is also one reason for the for the rising number of of Saudi jihadists fighting in in, in Daesh ranks, uh, which are about three thousand eight hundred right now. As far as I know, and um, and of course uh, the Saudi uh, leadership has to deal with it. But for now, as we can see in the last couple of months um, after after Salman um, um, came into power, um, he is focusing mostly on uh, on the Yemen issue, um, which has which has 
um, provoked, of course, lots of criticism uh, internationally. But on a domestic, uh, uh, on the domestic level, he has all the support of most of the or, or a huge majority of the of the Saudi Arabians. But uh, by now, he is neglecting um, to implement real economic reforms, force the diversification of the economy, force the privatization and the liberalization of the economy, and to and to create jobs. So the the bubble uh, of the of the of the of the official administrational ad administrative sector is is very huge, and um, uh, it, it would be it wouldn't be able to to so for Saudi Arabia to absorb all the all the young people uh, within the official sector. Um, speaking about domestic support or domestic problems caused due to the war, I think that's also a very relevant issue in Turkey, especially with the parliamentary elections coming up. Um, President Erdogan was a recent visitor in Riyadh, and while Sebastian mentioned that officially the government in Saudi Arabia has cut support for Jabhat al-Nusra, um, there seems to be an rapprochement between Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and also a consensus on the support of other um, militant groups, opposition groups, uh, fighting in Syria. Is that some kind of rapprochement that will continue and maybe dominate Turkish-Saudi alliance foreign policy on Syria for the next months, for the next years? Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, before getting to your question, let me uh, thank to uh, Heinrich Böll for this very timely and imp important event and also inviting me to share my ideas uh, about Turkey's uh, position. And also before coming to your question, uh, let me briefly summarize the Turkey's position regarding Syria, uh, which will pave the way for uh, your question. Uh, I think that there is a misunderstanding regarding Turkey's position regarding Syria, because when, when I follow the Western media, uh, everybody thinks that Turkey is looking for a, a collapse of the regime with its all state institutions, Uh, and a re new uh, political structure uh, which will be uh, established by the whole opposition. I don't think that this is the uh, situation because uh, as we experienced the Iraqi experience, uh, Turkey is not looking for a rapid and whole collapse of the state inside Syria because it is, it is Turkey who will suffer uh, from such a uh, process inside Syria because <coughs> Uh, after the invasion of Iraq, we know that the state institutions were collapsed and uh, still, uh, after a decade, we are still uh, experiencing instability inside Iraq. So Turkey, in its longest border, do not want to see a new Iraq. So in that sense, uh, Turkey is not supportive of the collapse of the state institutions inside Syria. What Turkey is seeking uh, inside Syria is... Uh, is a political transition, which also includes some elements of the regime itself. Of course, it is not publicly, uh, this, uh, in, its, in Turkey's foreign policy, it's not publicly uh, declared, but I'm sure that as a supportive of, uh, supporter of the political solution, Turkey is also seeking for a solution which also includes the, re the regime and also state uh, institutions which should be uh, preserved uh, inside, uh, inside Syria. What Turkey is looking for is the, uh, is the Assad will leave the presidency and its closed circles, but of course the new political uh, structure inside Syria will involve some elements of uh, the uh, state institutions. Turkey is not seeking for a whole collapse and a rapid collapse Uh, of the state uh, inside Syria. In that sense, I think there is a misunderstanding uh, regarding uh, Turkey's position. And when I come to your question about Turkey's uh, alignment with uh, Saudi Arabia, this is a reality. Uh, and I should say that uh, it gave some products on the, uh, on the ground, which we are experiencing in, in Idlib now, and also in that uh, area. Uh, the, because the main reason uh, of the failure of the opposition uh, is that they are fractured, and the main reason for the fractation of the opposition is that the, the all regional actors and all, the all global actors has different policies inside Syria, although they are unified in 
top linked regime. But they were supporting different groups, uh, different armed groups, and also political opposition. So in that sense, after the uh, Salman's rule in Saudi Arabia, there's a new uh, foreign policy uh, in the Middle East. And in that sense, uh, Saudi Arabia is looking for, for a regional uh, system, an alliance system, which, also, which includes Turkey as a crucial actor uh, in that sense, and also uh, cooperating with Turkey to unify uh, the opposition groups uh, on the ground. Uh, for example, the leader of the uh, Islamic army, which is backed by Saudi Arabia, was in Turkey in last weeks and uh, met with uh, Turkish officials. So this is also a great sign that there is an increasing uh, cooperation and coordination between Turkey and Saudi Arabia to unify the opposition groups, the armed opposition uh, on the field. The main reason for the failure of the opposition was their fractation. And the main reason behind that is the different policies of the regional actors and the global, global actors who, who are supporting the opposition uh, inside Syria. Now, uh, with the increasing uh, coordination and cooperation between Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, uh, we see uh, an advancement uh, of the opposition uh, on the field. So uh, the thing you mentioned is the main uh, reason uh, behind that uh, advancement uh, of the uh, opposition uh, on the ground. Will it continue? I think it will continue uh, because it started with the uh, Iranian increasing Iranian influence in the region. Uh, but Turkey and Saudi Arabia, including Qatar, saw that this uh, cooperation resulted with the advancement of, of the opposition. So uh, I think they are going to continue because it gave some products, like we saw in Idlib, in Dera, uh, around Damascus, in the Lebanese uh, border. Uh, before 2015, uh, it was uh, regime's years. I mean, they, they were successful to protect, uh, to defend Damascus and also all uh, city centers, uh, and afterwards they were really success successful to advance in uh, opposition controlled areas. But 2015 uh, uh, showed us that the Syrian crisis uh, cannot be solved uh, by a military uh, solution. And I think also the regime is convinced that they cannot be victorious uh, in that war. Uh, so uh, the rate, recent developments, I think, uh, paved the way for the regime to, to be convinced uh, for the political uh, solution. Uh, and also regarding Turkey's position uh, to ISIS, uh, there are also a lot of claims uh, about that issue, and also which I believe is a, a misunderstanding. Uh, uh, because when I followed uh, and observed the Western media, that there are a lot of claims that Turkey is supportive of uh, ISIS uh, on the border uh, area. Uh, first of all, I should say that it is Turkey who is suffering because of ISIS rule in northern Syria. Uh, Turkey is not a country living uh, thousands of uh, kilometers away uh, from the region. Turkey is a part of the region and a lot of border gates are controlled by ISIS. So we have experienced a terrorist attack in Istanbul the biggest city in, East, in Turkey, uh, in Sultan Ahmed, at, in an ISIS attack. And I am very well aware that Turkish security uh, apparatus is very concerned about ISIS existence inside Turkey, which used to be Al-Qaeda cells in Turkey, uh, probably transformed to ISIS cells inside Turkey. Uh, so Turkey feels so much vulnerable to ISIS. Uh, so it is not Turkey could not apply a policy uh, like uh, its Western allies. So I think Turkey, uh, the, the Western allies of Turkey should understand Turkey's uh, position. Uh, it is not only Sultan Ahmed attacks. Uh, we have uh, a lot of attacks, attacks in the border gates. And also ISIS is fighting with the whole Turkish allies in Syria and in Iraq. So how could we explain that reality with the so-called claim that Turkey is supporting uh, ISIS because, you know, ISIS is fighting with the uh, Iraqi 
e, Kurdistan regional government, which is Turkey's allies. E, they are fighting with the e, Syrian opposition inside Syria, which Turkey is, is, is supportive. And Turkmans in Iraq and also in, in, in Syria, which Turkey is also uh, supporting. So uh, it's a real paradox. I mean, when you say that Turkey is indirectly supporting ISIS and also the realities uh, on the ground. And so also in that sense, I think there's a, a misunderstanding. Uh, and uh, why Turkey is so much reluctant about being a very active part of anti-IS coalition? So this is another uh, question uh, that is asked uh, in Western media. Uh, Turkey do not want to be a part of a plan which she do not believe. Because Turkey does not believe that this plan, this strategy, which is shaped by US, is not, uh, will not produce uh, outcomes and will, will not be successful. Because this plan is only concentrating on fighting Daesh uh, or ISIS. But Turkey is asking uh, for a more inclusive, a comprehensive uh, solution, which created the ISIS itself. I'm so happy to hear that uh, Mr. Hoff also and other speakers are in line with Turkey's position in the, in the first session that <laughs> uh, there could be no solution to the Syrian crisis without finding a solution, a political solution to the Syrian crisis itself. Because it is whether ISIS or other radical groups which will emerge from that crisis. So Turkey believes that, uh, yes, ISIS is a huge threat a huge threat and a direct threat for Turkey rather than other countries should be solved, but it could be solved by, in the context of the Syrian crisis and also including Iraq. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think... Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, I think you touched upon uh, quite a lot of uh, interesting issues, um, especially when talking about ways out of the dilemma that we're currently facing, and I think all of you brought, brought that up. Um, in, in your opinion, um, what, and maybe also reacting to what the other said, um, if you want to break out of this, what you described as this zero-sum game, what would you think would your, or the parties you spoke about, um, your, the countries and Hezbollah, consider to be a possible solution that they could agree to, which would not necessarily infringe on their interests, especially uh, the question that you brought up. Um, Iran versus Saudi Arabia. Um, is it possible for... I mean, Saudi Arabia is exporting its Wahhabi ideology, but as recently somebody said to us at a conference, um, at least they are not... It's not an expensive... I mean, there's no uh, expansionist ideology behind it, other than Iran. Is that something, a thought that you would... Was said by, by a Saudi guy, so honestly, <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, No, no, just... <laughs> well, it was also said by somebody from the Foreign Office. But um, somebody, you, something that you would subscribe to, and if that is really the case, how could a solution be found that is not a zero-sum game, either for Iran, for Saudi Arabia, for Hezbollah, or for Turkey? Please feel free. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the crucial issues in terms of if one wants to find a political solution to Syria is to ensure that Riyadh and Tehran are on the same page. And that, at the moment, seems extremely difficult and problematic. Um, the Saudi-Iranian rivalry over the past few years, post-2003, has taken on epic, enormous proportions in the sense that you have two regimes, two different ideologies, one a conservative monarchy, pro-Western, pro-American, another revolutionary, anti-Western, Shia, the other Sunni, um, trying to flex their muscles. Um, Saudi power has been magnified, of course, by the, weak, the weakness of Egypt, Syria, and, and um, Iraq. Um, so, uh, so I think one of the things that needs to be dealt with is, is making sure that if there are peace talks, that these two countries can compromise on a political future solution for 
uh, for Syria, but in terms of that, how events have panned out over the past several months, over the past year, I think things have, have gotten worse in the sense that um, somebody mentioned Yemen, and in terms of giving an Iran perspective of how that's also related to Syria, as I said before at the outset, Iran and Syria have had a long-standing alliance for 36 years. So for Iran, that was the political status quo ante, this alliance. And since 2011, after the unrest and then the, the conflict in Syria turning into a proxy war with the Saudis also helping the opposition. From the Iranian perspective, if you want to understand the viewpoint from Tehran, Tehran's, uh, Tehran's actions in Yemen are, well, if you're going to interfere in the domestic affairs of our ally, we're going to, we're going to um, interfere in your backyard. Um, j just a note of clarification. Um, Yem the Yemeni conflict in its origins is domestic. But of course, as, it's, as it morphed, Iran also opportunistically has in, it become involved in it um, in order to irritate the Saudis. And I think there's a, a delight in Tehran that King Salman was foolish enough that he took the bait. The Saudis have gone in. And as far as Tehran is concerned for the moment, the, the, the more the Saudis get bogged down in Yemen, uh, the, 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 the better. Um, and added to that, in terms of what Mr. Sons was saying, I, I should say, um, Everybody's talking about the oil price collapse. Well, the Saudis are the biggest the swing producer. They can cut back on their production. But one of the main reasons, if not the key reason, they have cut back. They have basically um, refused to um, increase production to boost the price of oil is because they want to undercut Iran in terms of uh, Iran's support for Syria and Iran's involvement um, in Iran's involvement uh, in, in the region. I think in terms of the Western press, you've been have a lot of articles over the past few months over the year that Iran is, is, uh, you know, is, is creating an empire, a rebirth of a new Persian empire and all that. But I think that's really overstated. I think Iranian power ex is exaggerated. Um, the situation of the Iraqi government, whether al-Malik or al al-Abadi, is precarious. Assad is precarious. As Hanin just mentioned, you know, um, Hezbollah's influence and, and popularity in Lebanon is rock bottom. So yes, Iran is a, is a regional player. It has a degree. But, but I think one should not um, exaggerate that and blow that um, a, a out of proportion. So, so Also, yeah. when it comes to the idea of exporting the revolution, can Iranian politics in the region do without that? That depends on... well. It depends on who has the upper hand domestically and also the regional and international context. So I think the, um, if those who are, are and continue to be advocates of the export of the revolution, if they think conditions are propitious, um, favorable on the, on the regional international uh, um, level, they, they will do that. But if they feel that um, it's time to scale back, it's more... more uh, it's, it's wiser to be prudent um, and all that. They, they will adjust, uh, adjust their, their, policies, um, their policies accordingly. As I've said before, the, the, the first and foremost priority of the regime is survival, since it's an authoritarian regime. The second is national security, the territorial integrity and independence of Iran. And of course, if conditions, um, uh, conditions are favorable uh, to, uh, to export the revolution. As I said, I think Rouhani and his team are conservative, but they're pragmatists. And I think if a, an agreement is reached on the nuclear deal, and he has, so he, he and his team have that political capital, they may be able to build on, the, build on that, not only in terms of certain domestic changes, as I said, he's not a reformist, but uh, in terms of also foreign policy and also maybe scaling back, unlike what some of the, the Supreme Leader and the um, Revolutionary Guards want. Just because I wanted to make something clear about what you said, I, I did not, I, when you you said I say uh, Hezbollah's popularity and influence in Lebanon is rock bottom. Hezbollah's popularity is rock bottom, but not influence. Hezbollah's influence is increasing. So just to uh, make sure that influence is really like much higher now, and influence. And this brings me back to the original question: when we talk about Hezbollah's influence and Iran's influence in the region, from experience, I've lived in Lebanon all my life. Every time Hezbollah cannot win a battle uh, democratically through elections or through a political solution 
We had a number of crises in the past. I remember the May 7 events. I can talk to you a lot about these, but every time Hezbollah cannot reach a political solution or cannot win democratically, they use force. And I know that this is their method in Syria now, and anything that will come up like in terms of political solution that will not uh, uh, secure their interests in Syria, they will use force, and they will continue using force. Iran uh, priority is definitely its internal problems now. Any s money that will come after lifting the sanctions by the end of the year, probably, will definitely go to internal uh, issues because now also we witness a lot of uh, demonstrations inside, inside Iran by syndicates, especially the teachers. And they have to silence this part of the community as well. But I think, this is my personal opinion, we'll see if it's, uh, I'm right or not, most of the spending will go to military operations in the region. A lot of it will go also to Hezbollah services in Lebanon because they need to also silence these people. They need to get back their popularity. And they need to secure certain things in Syria. Considering the political solution, I said that they want this corridor and everything that will not guarantee these interests in, in Syria, uh, they will, it will be off the table. This is what they want. In details, uh, it's really about the timing. Now things are moving very fast. A political solution proposed today is going to be uh, today. The political uh, solution proposed a few months from now will be different from political solution proposed today. The reason is that you now have Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia aligning and forming Jaysh al Fatah, okay? The army, uh, conquest army, which has freed Idlib, Jusr al Shagur, Al Mastoumi. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but there have been some, uh, not enough, not uh, uh, drastic changes that would like change the games on the ground, but uh, enough for Hezbollah to feel that they have to, you know, like do something on the ground. So now they're fighting in Qalamun. Why Qalamun is very important. Kalamun is important because it also uh, secures uh, the, the corridor to, to, the, uh, to the borders of Lebanon, to, uh, to the uh, coast. But also Kalamun is important because it will win Hezbollah bargaining chips for the future negotiations. It will give them access to the Golan Heights. Okay, This is very important for Hezbollah because a political solution proposed after they win Qalamun and have access to the Golan, they will sit at the negotiating uh, table with more power, with more bargaining chips, saying, you know, like, we want this, otherwise we will use that. Eventually, not now. A battle in the Golan, Golan Heights now against Israel it will backfire. Hezbollah will not go for it now. The battle with Israel anywhere now is out of the question, but it's a bargaining ship for later for the negotiations. This is uh, uh, one thing. Second, uh, another thing that uh, Hezbollah is working on now very diligently is what, Hezbollah, what, what Nasrallah mentioned in his recent speeches. In Lebanon, we have this uh, uh, equation, Shab Jaysh Muqawama. It's Hezbollah's equation for, for control, basically, which is the people, the army, and the resistance. Okay? Nasrallah said very clearly, and his people now are like all over the place, in Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria, this is going to be the equation. Iran's equation in this, these three countries is going to be Jaysh Shab Muqawama, the people, the army, and the resistance. In Syria, the Jaysh, the Syrian army, the Shab, which means the defense uh, units, the, the, which was basically also Shiite Alawites, and the Muqawama, the resistance, which is Hezbollah. In Iraq, it's the same thing. You have the same army, the same resistance, and the same units. This is becoming also a sectarian equation that will be implemented in Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria. Shiites will stick together in all three regions, and any political solution that will uh, uh, also hamper this kind of uh, uh, sectarian uh, uh, factions uh, uh, will not work because they want to guarantee also. This gets me to the last, last uh, point of... Um, uh, why do you think Ramadi and Tadmor fell so fast without fighting? Okay? Yes. N nothing, like, they were handed to ISIS, okay? <laughs> and this shows you again how uh, things are, are going uh, uh, in the region for Iran. Ramadi uh, in Iraq uh, and, and Tadmor in, in Syria... Uh, let me go back to one, one thing I wanted to say earlier, sorry. It's, it's, I, I really think like Iran, Hezbollah basically, and Iranian factions in the region, and ISIS are frenemies. They hate each other. Frenemies, yes. Uh, friends, enemies, basically. Uh, do you know who is number one client 
for ISIS oil industry. It's the Assad regime. It's not Turkey. It's the Assad regime. They are number one client. Okay, ISIS was created uh, uh, in, in Syria, and it turned out that ISIS is like who who look who looks now as if you know like the 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 better uh, solution uh, for the West. ISIS, uh, Hezbollah and Assad. Uh, ISIS cre was, was also created because a lot of these Islamists were released from Assad prisons during the revolution. So I never heard really of any fight between Hezbollah and ISIS in Syria. I've always heard about fighting between Hezbollah and Nusra, Hezbollah and the Free Syrian Army, Hezbollah and other factions. But ISIS and Hezbollah never really fought. It's as if, you know, like, we understand our boundaries. You have your state, we have our state. This is exactly what happened in Ramadi. We don't want the Sunni areas in Iraq. We don't want the Sunni areas in Syria. You can have the north, you can have uh, Haida. So this kind of, you know, like, not a formal partition, but kind of, you know, like, let's have our own uh, areas with our sectarian army, with our interest, uh, the corridor. And, you know, like, you can, you can have yours. And this is, we will be interested, basically... This, uh, uh, for, for Iran and Hezbollah and, and their, uh, the Shia in the region, uh, this might be a good solution. But it cannot be a final solution. Even if everybody agrees on this solution, it cannot work because Assad cannot stay. Uh, ISIS and Iran are not the only players. You have other players that will not be satisfied. And you have to also ask, uh, ask them what they need and this is not going to be okay for them. But it, it boils down to, to the corridor in, in a lot of... To the corridor, definitely. But to an, to an Al Alawite state it. on the coast, Alawite state that would link to uh, this corridor to the borders of Lebanon, to the definitely Golan, uh, because it strengthens their, uh, their chips. And then, of course, uh, whatever they can get meanwhile. Yeah. But okay. <laughs> this, is, this is basically okay. it. Um, What, what is the case for Turkey? I mean, how would uh, like a possible solution that is agreeable for all look like? And uh, I'm I'm aware that uh, yeah we don't have that much time left. So if I could both ask you and Sebastian afterwards uh, for a short answer. First of all, let me uh, brief, briefly evaluate the importance of Syria for Turkey. Uh, Syria, uh, we have the longest border uh, with Syria, uh, and Syria is our opening gate to Middle East, so it has a strategic importance for Turkey's uh, Middle East policy. This is the first uh, point. And the second thing is Turkey wants uh, to trade with the region, so Turkey wants stability in the region. So the stability inside Syria is in the best interest of Syria and also democracy which uh, enables sustainable uh, stability inside Syria. But uh, as a result of the civil war, which I am a bit pessimistic about uh, democracy, but still we can establish a stability, uh, stability inside Syria, which is in the best interest uh, of Turkey. So in that sense, Turkey is supportive of political solution. So we should also put it uh, that way. But Turkey also looks hard power and also military measures against the Assad regime as a way to convince and push the Assad regime uh, to believe that, uh, to convince the Assad regime uh, to a political solution. Because uh, from the beginning, they always believed that all diplomatic initiatives and also political process as a means to uh, pursue their rule inside Syria and as a means to suppress the opposition by military means to gain uh, some time. So in that sense, Turkey believes there should be some kind of uh, military measures against the Assad regime to convince them that they will never be victorious. So they can never suppress uh, the opposition. So Turkey looks uh, the uh, hard power and military measures in that sense. Uh, and Turkey, I believe, is not Uh, seeking uh, for a regime change inside Syria as a means of ideological obsession, which is regularly, regularly raised in uh, Western media. It is a political necessity, actually. But the Turkish leadership could not imagine any solution where Assad would stay. As a person, I think uh, Turkey believes that Assad has no 
future in Syria as a person and his, and his close circles. But this doesn't mean that uh, there should be a whole collapse, as I mentioned in my presentation, as a, a, a whole collapse uh, of the regime itself. Turkey also understood, uh, understand that uh, neither side will be victorious in that war. So in that sense, there will be a new political structure which every group, which is mainly based on ethnic and sectarian lines, uh, will rule or uh, have de facto uh, regions uh, that they will rule in their uh, areas. Turkey is aware uh, of that. Uh, but Turkey wants mainly US, but also uh, in general West, to give strong signs uh, to the Assad regime. I was also uh, thinking to give examples of the PKK case and also Rafik Hariri after the assassination of Rafik Hariri and also the chemical weapons issue. But in the first session, Mr. Yazidi, I think, uh, gave these uh, examples. Uh, this is a traditional uh, Syrian foreign policy. Uh, you know, uh, two steps forward and one step back. I mean, when they feel that they are under pressure, they step back. So you don't need to intervene militarily, direct military intervention. So when they see that there is a real strong sign that they should do something, they step back. As I said, at uh, the PKK case, uh, the 2005 after refugee assassination and the chemical weapons issue. So, uh, for example, after the uh, Kerry statement that at some point we should uh, negotiate with the Assad regime. Turkey was disturbed by that declaration, not because of its uh, core uh, nature, but because that it encourages the regime that they can pursue that war. So Turkey wants more strong, stronger signs that Assad cannot be victorious. So uh, this is what uh, Turkey is seeking for. Uh, if you let me, I also want to clarify one gentleman's questions in the first session. He was asking Mr. Hoff to push Turkey to open the borders in Kobani region. Uh, I don't know how many refugees do uh, all European countries have, but I think it is less than 200,000 or less than 150,000. Uh, after Kobane issue, when ISIS attacked Kobane, only in two days, 100, more than 150,000 Kobane people immigrated to Turkey and the borders were open. They are st still in Turkey and all costs of, of those people are uh, afforded by Turkish government. So, you know, asking Turkey to open its border and do more in Kobane I think it's unfair. I mean, it's not West or other countries that, that is facing the implications, negative implications of the Syrian refugees. We are hosting nearly 50% of the Syrian refugees in all uh, region, and Turkey is not receiving any kind of international aid, and Turkey is doing it uh, by itself. So in that sense, uh, the Kobane issue, yes, uh, Turkey has some kind of... Uh, doubts about the existence of PKK. So in that sense, Turkey is supporting another solution. But when you look at the humanitarian uh, side, I mean, uh, we are still uh, hosting uh, more than 150,000 Kobani people inside Turkey in, uh, in the camps. So. I, I, that's an um, important point. I think, like, uh, especially the role of refugees uh, will come up in the next panel as well. Um, Last but not least, and then we leave a little bit room for questions, is the question is, uh, we've now already spoken about the red lines of other actors. Turning this from a zero-sum game into something else, is there any way that under King Salman it's feasible or one could think of a solution that where Saudi Arabia would agree with Iran on a solution on Syria? Um, I think there is an opportunity um, when it comes to common interests, um, not only regarding Syria, but also regarding Iraq or, um, or the fight against Daesh or, for example, uh, drug trafficking and all that. All that stuff where, where both countries have common interests. Um, however, 
what whatever Salman wants to do, uh, he's not he cannot act independent. So um, Saudi Arabia is not an absolute monarchy. He, he he has to take care about the other influential players, not only within the the Al Saud, but also within, for for instance, the the uh, religious establishment of the Wahhabis, and. Um, from an historical and traditional point of view, the legitimacy of the Al Saud is based on the alliance with with the Wahhabis, and of course, Wahhabism is anti-Shia, and uh, therefore, um, it is not. It is an ideological question if there want if there might be a reconciliation with Iran uh, be possible, um, and not only a political one. When it comes to pragmatism and to real politic, then Saudi Arabia has shown in the past um, that uh, it is able to to cope with 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 uh, with enemies and to um, uh, to cooperate with them and to um, to to co-op them um, uh, either either uh, abroad or uh, at home. Uh, but the Iran issue is is um, as as you have said is is over exaggerated um, is exaggerated is 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 a kind of iranoia and therefore it is not possible by now uh, to overcome this um, mentality of of anti anti Iran um, uh, mentality inside the inside the Saudi uh, the Saudi society. Nonetheless, if if King Salman wants to reconcile with Iran about different aspects or not. So this has to be taken into consideration and he cannot act independently. Thank you. Um, so a rather bleak outlook. Um, we have a l not much, but like 15 minutes left for questions. Um, and um, it's also possible to pose those in Arabic. Um, ah, okay, maybe. Okay, maybe we start with the gentleman in the back and um, then to Christoph and then to the front. Yeah. <laughs> so, ah, sorry, sorry, we start with the gentleman in the back, <laughs> then with, sorry, then with the lady next to Christoph, Christoph, and um, then we answer the first round and then we hopefully have time for a second round. Please keep it brief and please. Uh, state uh, who you are and if you have okay. any affiliation. Thank you. Okay. My name is Karim Al Asadi. Ich bin Schriftsteller aus dem Irak. Meine Frage ist an Frau Hanin Ghaddar, aber auch an Herrn Orhan. Ich betrachte die Situation seit Jahren und stelle, ich betrachte die Situation in unserer Region woher ich, ich komme, aus dem Irak, seit Jahren und komme leider zu Ergebnis, dass dieser Konflikt ein ethnischer, religiöser Konflikt geworden und dass die Rolle der arabischen Intellektuellen zu Null gegangen ist. Als Betrachtung habe ich irgendwie auch festgestellt, dass ist Massenbewegung Richtung Saudi-Arabien und die Regierung in Saudi-Arabien gibt. Das heißt, diese Regierung hat sehr viel Gewicht zugewonnen mit dunklen Mitteln. Was in der Geschichte steht, das heißt, wahhabitische Regierung... Sorry, I hate to cut you short, but as we have only 50 minutes left, can okay. I ask you to just pose the question to the point? Wie, die Frage dann ist meine Frage in beiden, aber auch Herr Sohns, was ist das Geheimnis, dass eine völlig rückgängige Regierung und unmenschliche Strategie und Art von Denken gegen Menschenrechte und Demokratie und Frauenrechte so großes Gewicht kommt in einem Gebiet, wo es intellektuelle und progressive Menschen gibt. Danke schön. Thank you. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. My name is Petra Steenen. Um, I have a question for Sebastian, but maybe the others can react to it as well. Why is it that in Europe and the United States, we somehow have no strategy towards dealing with the political influence of Saudi Arabia based on all that money? 
it really surprises me. Within the European Parliament, within the Dutch government, I used to be a diplomat for the Dutch government, but I also feel within the US establishment, there is no strategy on how to deal with the political influence of Saudi Arabia. Why is that? Thank you. Um, Mr. Reuter? Christoph Reuter, Der Spiegel. Okay. Two concise questions. The first to Jubin Gudarsi. We have the nuclear negotiations ongoing with Iran. Probably there will be a deal uh, in short time to come. But what does this mean in terms of Syria? Does it mean that Iran can demand concessions from the US, from the rest of the world to have a free hand in Syria? Or does it mean the other way around that the rest of the world can demand concessions from Iran in terms of finding a political solution uh, for Syria. And the second question to Oyton Orhan, I absolutely agree with you that it's a paradox that Turkish authorities um, tolerate the presence, the movements, the border crossing of Daeshis in Turkey, from Turkey to Syria, but how do you explain that there are plenty of well-documented observations of Daeshis arriving at airports in, Syria, uh, in Turkey crossing the border, um, having border crossings for Daesh open at the same time while the one in Kobani was completely sealed and closed. Thank you. Maybe first go to a first round of answers and then uh, we'll have time for a second round of questions. Um, whoever wants to start? I'll just answer the question that was addressed to me uh, by Mr. Karim. Uh, if I want to answer this. It's, 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 uh, it was a little bit, didn't, probably I didn't understand it very well, but uh, when you're talking about the Arab intellectuals, I think you were also talking about the role of Arab intellectuals in the midst of this uh, uh, regional influence. Um, I don't know if there are Arab intellectuals anymore. And your assumption that there are influential Arab intellectuals is, uh, I do not agree with that. Uh, int the intellectual class uh, uh, requires uh, a middle class, a uh, vibrant economy, stability, that would produce intellectual class, which we had in Lebanon, Baghdad, Syria, f for a long time. But we lost the middle class. Uh, education system uh, is, is, is not uh, as it is. Uh, I, I don't, I think they, we have like the brain drain in the region is very high, so the intellectual uh, class migrated long time ago, and they abandoned their role in the region. So I think that is why exactly uh, the Arab dictatorships and, and the regimes that have more influence now cannot be uh, faced with any like intellectual class. So I, I, I think it doesn't exist anymore. Um, okay. So, okay. <laughs> Um, regarding the question of the <clears throat> of the supremacy and the influence of Saudi Arabia and why is that the case, um, it's a very difficult question, and um, I don't want to I don't want to give a historical uh, or or lecture about uh, Saudi history and and uh, how um, how Saudi Arabia was uh, was developed, uh, but it's. It's about money, for sure. Um, it's about the um, guardian of the two holy shrines in Mecca and Medina. Um, but it's also about uh, the opportunity for Saudi Arabia to uh, develop itself as a kingdom, as a country, with, without without a strong interference from the West, so to say. So uh, there was no 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 real colonial power um, um, uh, on the on the Saudi ground uh, in 19th uh, 20th century. And, and therefore, they they have maybe better preconditions uh, in comparison to other to other Arab countries. But I, I I know this is not not a very good explanation, and I have to make it short. Uh, but maybe we can talk afterwards about about the influence of Saudi Arabia. So I will leave it by here. Um, the other the other question is also very important. We've talked about it uh, before the, before the conference started. So why why is there no coherent strategy um, on on Saudi Arabia in in the West? I cannot I cannot speak or all or not a strategy at all. Whatever whatever you might say. Okay. Um, so I can I cannot I cannot speak about uh, the Netherlands or, or other European country in, uh, country. But what I what I see within my country is that there is a there is a lack of strategy, uh, not only um, uh, due to Saudi Arabia but to the whole region, uh, um, due to due to the lack of experience, um, uh, due to um, a lack of political will. 
um, and uh, and it needs to there needs to or the, it is it is absolutely needed that uh, that a strategy um, um, is formulated if if it would be possible to to fulfill all the ingredients of such a strategy in the future this remains to be seen and of course we have to act ad hoc in germany and in other european or western countries but when it comes to saudi arabia um, we are um, of course there are double standards um, on the on the one hand it is a very reliable partner with regards to anti uh, uh, to the fight against terrorism and and um, with regards to economic interests on the other hand we have to we have to express that it is one of it is a country where uh, where human rights are abused every day and and uh, uh, where where people are killed every day by the government 86 uh, only in uh, in 2015 uh, however uh, we have to deal with them and if we if we are not formulating uh, a strategy how to deal with such with, with such players um, then we then we cannot act, and then we are only reacting on 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 uh, political developments. However, when it comes to Germany, um, Germany is lacking leverage on on Saudi Arabia. This is quite clear. So we have no real impact on on what's going on in Saudi Arabia, and we cannot influence political developments within Saudi Arabia. Um, this became uh, very clear when when uh, when Sigmar Gabriel visited Riyadh and and expressed the uh, the treatment of the of the blogger uh, Raif Badawi um, uh, very very clearly, which was which was shown. Uh, I, I cannot exp explain it very correctly, but um, from the Saudi side it was not taken very seriously. So don't interfere in politics, don't in our stuff, um, because you, you don't have the leverage. This was, this was very clear on the, between the lines. And, and this, is, uh, this is what, uh, so, so which role can Germany play? Just one sentence. Maybe um, we can play a role as a mediator in, um, in bringing together, for example, arc rivals like, like Iran and Saudi Arabia, not alone, but maybe together with Oman or whatever. Um, this might be a possible role of, of, of Germany, but we, we, I, I think we should not, we should not overstate um, our influence on countries such as Saudi Arabia because they, they are relying on themselves or, um, or on the US and not on Germany. Thank you. Let me give an answer to Mr. Royer's, if I'm not wrong, question regarding Turkey's position uh, against ISIS. I mean, if you look at the map, you can easily see that uh, Turkey is the easiest way for the foreign fighters to cross border. And also, uh, it, because it has the longest border, Turkey is an open country, is a tourism country, and also the ISIS is active on the northern front, which is close to Turkey's border. But on the other hand, as I said, Turkey is a tourism country, and also we uh, host nearly more than 35 million tourists every year. Uh, so you cannot prevent uh, people, mainly coming from the West, uh, not only the Middle East countries, uh, mainly coming from the West and also other countries, more than 80 countries, uh, prevent those people who came to Istanbul that, uh, and uh, take them into custody that they are, they, they are uh, possible ISIS fighters who will cross the border and attend in the Syrian uh, civil war. As a si Turkish citizen, every day, and as an observer, every day I read news about a lot of people uh, who are uh, captured by Turkish security uh, officials, uh, the, the ISIS, possible ISIS fighters uh, on the border area and also in, in Istanbul. Uh, but the thing is, Turkey is seeking for more intelligence cooperation with the West. For example, let me give an example about the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris. Uh, those terrorists uh, were, uh, came to Turkey, crossed the border to Syria, and then uh, returned uh, to Paris. But why Turkish officials, no, no, they, they were. They crossed the border via Turkey and uh, from Syria, and then they returned to Paris and uh, France. And why Turkish officials did not uh, captured them because it was not on the list which was given by the French authorities to Turkey. Every day, and in total, thousands of people are sending 
back to their origin countries, uh, which are given by its allies, by Turkey's allies, because they are on the list. Uh, but those names, for example, were not on the list, so uh, Turkey sh couldn't know that they, uh, they were possible ISIS fighters and crossed the border, attend the ISIS and returned uh, their origin countries and made that uh, horrible attacks uh, in Paris. So uh, this is the way Turkey is looking, and Turkey is looking for more intelligence sharing uh, from its allies uh, in, uh, in, in West. So uh, I think when you look at the news, uh, for example, let me give another example. A guy from France came uh, to Turkey, and it was resent to France, which is a possible Nusra Front fighter. A couple of months later, this guy came to Turkish uh, airports again. So, uh, you know, that there is that kind of uh, lack of uh, cooperation between Turkish security and also Western uh, allies. Uh, it is impossible to, uh, you know, uh, prevent the whole uh, cross-border of the possible ISIS fighters. Even U.S. cannot prevent uh, when the U.S. is not able to prevent any kind of uh, to, to protect its borders in Mexico. So in that sense, I mean, it is uh, unfair, again, unfair to, uh, to ask Turkey to, uh, to wholly control its border. But what can I say? Turkey is trying more to control its border uh, because uh, Turkey uh, was not uh, aware uh, that this situation, uh, the Syrian civil war, will evolve in that sense and also the ISIS, these radical groups will emerge in the northern front. So in that sense, Turkey was applying a more uh, flexible open-door policy, but uh, since the rise of ISIS, I think Turkey is trying to apply more measures uh, on the border area. Thank you. Thank you. Just, I'll try to be... Um, with regard to your question, um, uh, well, we'll, we'll have to see whether they reach an agreement at the end of June with, the, with regard to nuclear talks. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball in terms of predicting the future, but I think if there is an agreement, uh, as I said before, I think it, it, the, the government in Iran knows they've painted themselves into a corner and they're looking for a way out, but they're not going to just pull the rug from under us. That they're, they're looking for um, a, a, a hopefully diplomatic, a political solution. But um, at the same time, you know, things are moving and you have to look at the different elements in the equation. I'm, as I said, um, initially, um, over the past few weeks, things have been working against the Assad regime. You had the Syrian defense minister, Fad al Farij go to Tehran uh, end of April and um, also this month. We've had several, almost, almost unprecedented, several Iranian uh, senior Iranian officials and delegates going to Syria, Ali Akbar Veloyati, the foreign policy advisor of the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, going there, the um, head of the um, Iranian Parliament's Madras's foreign policy and national security committee, Aladin Burujerdi, and another delegation, because the situation, I think, is deteriorating. I think there's fundamental concern um, about the collapse of the Assad regime. But I, I agree with Hanin in the sense that Iran is no so much, not so much in love in now enamored with Assad, but they want their interests there to be preserved. If they can, it can be preserved by some other actor in some other context, they will, they will, um, they will, they will go for that. So um, uh, at the same time, I should also mention, because of the way things have been, Syria is important to Iran. Um, I think that's undisputable, but even more important than Syria is Iraq, and also with the rise of ISIS over the past year, not only its successes in Syria, but Iraq, um, Iran sees ISIS as a fundamental threat, not only to its security, but its regional interests. And I think a few days ago, the, uh, the statement by um, the, the uh, General, um, General Qasem Soleimani about, because Iran is very much involved and it, its commitment to regard ISIS could increase you know, in frustration, saying that the United States has, quote unquote, not done a damn thing against ISIS. So I think that needs to be uh, taken into consideration because there's so, there, there are several variables and priorities. I just want to make one last thing in terms of one or two people because they asked about about Saudi Arabia. I think if you look at it closely, Iran and Saudi Arabia in many ways are very similar. In some ways they're very different, but you have two reactionary fundamentalist regimes in, in certain ways. One 
uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, and also in Iran. I remember a few months ago I was in Tehran and uh, I was in a cab. The, the, the cab driver was a Kurd. He was a Sunni Kurd. And he was saying, you know, they don't allow us Sunnis to have a mosque in Tehran. So you have one, one regime which persecutes people who do not follow the Wahhabi, the other which, which basically uh, is not kind to non-Shias. Non so, but the, the difference is one is pro-Western, pro-American, the other isn't. So the West and the US have made a Faustian bargain with the Saudis, and I think since we saw since 9-11, this is coming back to hurt the US and the West, and it will continue to do so unless there are fundamental changes. But this is in part is because of Iran's foolish hostility towards the West and Iran. So that has to change, and I think that's why Obama is keen on reaching an agreement that, that may open the way for other changes in bilateral relations. Thank you very much. I had hoped that you would have time for another round of questions, but I've been signaled that unfortunately we don't. Um, however, uh, almost all our panelists uh, will stay for lunch and even longer. So uh, you are feel free, hopefully, I'm saying that in your name, uh, to just... Uh, come to them and uh, search a private talk uh, over lunch. Um, before you all leaving all again, I made the same mistake as my previous uh, colleague. Um, please don't forget to fill out the evaluation forms in your folders. We really need those to secure public funding to continue to offer such talks to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.